to welcome you to the second week in our new series on faithfulness. See, for the month of July, um, to help us really understand this countercultural practice of faithfulness, we're taking a journey through the book of Hosea, where we're seeing God's faithfulness to Israel and, and really to us, and what it means to live a life faithful to Him, and what are the consequences when we don't. And Hosea has 14 chapters, and I mentioned last week, it should take about 25 or 30 minutes to read through the whole book. But each week we're going to study a section of Hosea together and then read the chapters on our own during the week. And by the end of July, we will get through the whole book of Hosea, I promise. That's our goal. And last week we looked at chapters 1 through 3 together. And we really kicked off our second installment of the Bible Geeks Club. And if you're still not familiar with that, what that is, I encourage you to go back, watch last week's message, and actually go back to last July when we studied 1 Peter together, and we really kicked off this crazy thing that my wife started. So let me start with a question. Did you all do your homework for today? No, that's okay. At least we're honest. What was the homework for today? Read Hosea chapters 1 through 3 that we studied together last week, right? And that should have taken you about five minutes, quite honestly. So I encourage you, if you haven't done that, I would do that because we've got homework for this week too, right? <laughs> but the context here in Hosea is really, uh, Israel is a nation divided. Uh, they are in disobedience to God and the covenant that was made with him. They're given over to idol worship and self-reliance. And their leaders, as we saw last week, not so good, are really leading them astray. And so God has called Hosea to prophesy to Israel about what's going on, about the way they're living. But as we learned, not only did God call Hosea to preach his message to Israel, but he asked him to live it out. He asked him to marry an adulterous woman, have children with her, have this relationship with an unfaithful woman, with an unfaithful spouse. And that this, this relationship, this marriage that you're going to walk through really represents my relationship with Israel right now. And see, God called Hosea to experience this. as we just, He called him to experience, to go through this difficulty, because as he did, as he worked through this difficult relationship with his spouse, his marriage, he would really understand how God felt, what God was going through, what God was experiencing, and he could convey his message God's message with greater passion and impact. Remember I said we all have a story? Every one of us has a story to tell of what God has brought us through, what God is maybe allowing us to go through now. And that helps us to spread his word with greater impact and greater passion. And so these first three chapters really kind of give us this overarching idea, this overarching theme of the rest of the book for these next 11 chapters we're going to go through in the next few weeks. So we talked about a broken relationship, a broken relationship with God because of unfaithfulness and how that breaks the relationship that we have with Him. And not only that, it breaks God's heart. And that there are consequences for that. Sometimes punishment, discipline for that unfaithfulness. But the good news Right? We learned the good news, the restoration and redemption that we have because of God's faithfulness, not ours. Because of His unfailing love. So before we dive into the rest of the story, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just ask, ask that you would be present here today. We give you full control, full reign. This is your house. We ask that your Holy Spirit would move in and through us, Lord, that Again, my prayer this week, as it was last week, and it is every day, that you would open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to what you would have us hear, what you would have us learn, but more importantly, how you would have us live it out. So God, move in our hearts, transform us and change us today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so grab your Bibles or your favorite app on your phone or your tablet or whatever device you're using, and follow along this week as we look at Hosea 
chapters 4 through 6. And if you weren't here last week, remember I said we're not going to read each chapter line for line, verse for verse, here on Sunday, so you can relax a little bit. But I did say, just even a few minutes ago, we're going to have some homework, right? So what's the homework coming into next week? Read. 4 through 6, and if you haven't done 1 through 3, catch up. <laughs> we have extra homework, that's right. <laughs> but we're going to do that on our own. Okay, that's great. I was just checking. I want to make sure. I mean, you guys are really paying attention, and I appreciate that. Today we're going to start with Hosea 4, verses 1 through 2, where it says this. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Wow. Pretty tough. I see chapter 4 here opens in a very similar way to chapter 2, where Hosea was pointing out, these are the things that you're doing wrong. This is what's going on in the land of Israel. And it's not good. See, he's pointing out what the problem is with their relationship with God. And he's bringing these charges against them. He says there's no faithfulness. There's no love. There's no acknowledgement of God. He says what there is is there's cursing and lying and adultery, bloodshed. There's murder. Nothing was out of bounds. Basically, it's horrible. And see, these first two verses really are looking back at the covenant, again, that God made with his people, that he made with Israel. And it's pointing back to, really, the Ten Commandments, the law that he gave to Moses in Exodus 20. Hosea is says, Hosea saying, you're forgetting this. You're breaking every one of these commandments. You're breaking the law. But the worst one, Exodus 20, verses 2 through 3 says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. See, the worst mistake they were making is they forgot God. They forgot Him. Said they had no knowledge of Him. In fact, here in chapter 2, in verse 8, it says, she has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, new wine and oil, who lavished on her the silver and gold, which they used for Baal. So God's talking about Gomer going back to her prostitution, representing Israel doing the same thing, forgetting that I'm the one that brought you out of the land of slavery. I'm the one that brought you into the promised land. I'm the one that gave you all of these things, the prosperity that you're experiencing. And you're using them for these other gods. You're taking the good that I've given you. And you're worshiping other gods. And they were confusing God with Baal. See, they were still making sacrifices to God. But along, right along with the pagan sacrifices they were making to Baal. There was no distinction any longer. They had actually taken on the practices and the culture of the world around them. We mentioned, we talked about how the kings were making alliances with these foreign nations. As part of that, they were taking on these foreign practices and worshiping these other gods. How often do we allow the culture to influence how we worship our God? And it was pretty clear God was saying to them, You don't know me any longer. You say you do, but your actions don't back up your words. See, our faith and our actions, they're mirrors of one another. James chapter 2, verse 17 through 18 says this, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. 
See, James is, one of, again, one of my favorite books in the whole Bible. Maybe I'll get to teach on that someday. Hey, Bible Geeks installment three. Well, we'll see. <laughs> anyway, what James is telling us is that our faith is revealed by our behavior. And so Israel was revealing their faith, their lack of knowledge of God by their behavior. Did they really love God? Did they love each other? Did they show it? And Jesus tells us this same thing in John chapter 13, verse 35, where it says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We see this throughout Scripture. In Israel, their actions weren't backing up their words. See, they basically were just giving it lip service. Do we just give God lip service in our faith? I know there's times in my life I feel like I am. And you may be thinking, well, but you said they're still making sacrifices to God. So obviously they knew him. And we're acknowledging him. That's a good point. But see, God doesn't just want them or us to know him just to know him in an intellectual sense like he could really care less if Israel was continuing to make sacrifices he could honestly care less if we were here today what God doesn't care if we're here today now before I get these really bad emails and that I'm a heretic, that I don't know what I'm talking about, which sometimes I, I question myself, right? Don't mishear me. God cares. He wants us to gather together. Hebrews 10.25 says, to not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But the question is, does us meeting together on Sunday make a difference in our lives on Monday? Does us meeting together on Sunday change our relationship with God at all? Because if not, what good is it for us to be here? Now you're probably thinking, this is pretty hard stuff, bud. You're right, it is. It's challenging. As I study for this message and read through Hosea, I'm reminded of this stuff myself. As you read through it, it's hard. It's difficult. We go through some difficult stuff. But see, the consequences of not understanding this, of not getting it, can be severe. Hosea 4.6 tells us this. So I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of God, I will also ignore your children. See, the consequences of not understanding what God wants, not understanding that it's not just this intellectual thing, but he wants an intimate relationship. He wants to have an intimate knowledge of who he is. Says the consequences of that is rejection. He's going to reject us. He's going to reject Israel. He's going to destroy them. There's destruction. See, as I was preparing, it, it just reminded me of one of my favorite Psalms. It's Psalm 37, verse 4. It says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Let's see. Do my desires align with God's desires? Because I know the first few times I read that, I thought, and I misquoted it even to myself. It's like, whoo-hoo, God's going to give me what I want. That's not what that verse says. It says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And actually, the verse right before that, 3, it says, trust in the Lord and do good. 
Do I trust in the Lord? Are the desires of my heart aligned with God's desires for me and what he wants from me? What he wants from you, what he wants from Israel, his people. And see, I was reminded of that as I'm studying through Hosea and, and really this week. And I'm not sure why I didn't pick up on this last week. I guess maybe I'm a little slow. But do we understand that God is talking to Israel here? God is talking to his people. He's not talking to the foreign nations, he's not talking to the other people, he's talking to his people. true believers who are supposed to be. And then in verse 7 through 18, we really see Israel's response to what Hosea is telling them. What he's prophesying. What God's word is to them. Verse 7, it says, they exchanged their glorious God for something disgraceful. Verse 12, a spirit of prostitution leads them astray. They are unfaithful to their God. Verse 16, they are stubborn like a stubborn heifer. They weren't getting it. They were continuing to do what they wanted to do, what they were doing, and being unfaithful to God. See, they wanted to keep living the same life with no consequences. Or even worse, after all Hosea has prophesied to this point, they maybe didn't believe God had even noticed that that's what they had in their thoughts. It reminded me of the story of Elijah that actually we just heard a couple weeks ago from Pastor Derek. Right, The story of Elijah, when God calls Elijah, he says, I want you to go out and I want you to provoke the prophets of Baal. Go out and provoke them. Let's show them who the real God is. I'm going to show them. But remember in that story, it has, Elijah starts really poking the bear, starts taunting them, and says, hey, maybe your God's busy. Maybe he's off doing his business. Maybe that's what Israel was thinking now about God. They confused God with Baal. We've seen that already. They were worshiping other gods, so maybe they just thought, God didn't notice. We'll just keep doing what we're doing. Hosea 5, verses 1 through 4, tell us something differently. Hear this, you priests. Pay attention, you Israelites. Listen, royal house. This judgment is against you. You've been a snare, a snare at Mizpah, a, a net spread out on Tabor. The rebels are knee-deep in slaughter. I will discipline all of them. I know all about Ephraim. Israel is not hidden from me. Ephraim, you have now turned to prostitution. Israel is corrupt. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. A spirit of prostitution is in their heart. They do not acknowledge the Lord. Hosea says, listen up, everyone. I want you all to pay attention. I'm speaking to every one of you, speaking to my people. He says, let me have your attention. Judgment is about to come from the Lord if you keep doing what you're doing. And I noticed he specifically mentions priests and the royal house, along with all of Israel. Why? Why did he point to them specifically here? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. So well, let's see what the answer is. So remember in chapters 1 through 3, we talked about how there were really no good kings, that they were leading them astray, they were making these foreign alliances, and as goes leadership, so go the people. Well, in chapter 4, verse 7, it says, the more priests there were, the more they sinned against me. The more priests there were, the more they sinned against me. See, their leaders and their priests were just as bad, even worse. The kings, again, they're making foreign alliances 
with other nations, so they're dragging them into these relationships with foreign gods because that was part of the practice in that culture in that time. They were power hungry. They were seeking help outside of God. And the priests were leading them in idol worship. They no longer taught the people about the covenant, the law of God. They're teaching them about Baal. And they no longer acknowledged God. The priests were leading them astray. So, what does God think of that? He just said, listen up, you priest, you royal house. He's holding them responsible. He's holding them accountable. Because it was their job to lead the people well. And they're failing. They didn't care. You know what? That was a very sobering thought for me. I think I've mentioned to you before many times when I come up here when I'm preparing, my, my prayer is that I handle God's word well as I speak it to you. We as elders in the church, are we doing well? As leaders in God's church, are we doing well? See, they didn't care. So all of us who lead and teach, God holds us to a higher standard. It's just the way it is. And we have a great responsibility as the shepherds of his people. James 3.1 says this, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We have a greater responsibility. We're going to be held to a higher standard. Are we doing it well? But he did say, I'm holding you all accountable to what you're doing. Verse 2 said, God will discipline all of them. How many? All of them. That's what he meant. All of Israel, all of his people. And in case they were wondering if God didn't notice, maybe he just doesn't care. Maybe God just didn't see us. That they thought they were hiding. Hosea 5, 3 says this. Remember, it says, I know all about Ephraim. Israel is not hidden from me. Ephraim, you have now turned to prostitution. Israel is corrupt. Nothing is hidden from God. He sees everything. Whether we think we're hiding or not. So let me ask, do we try to hide our sin, our guilt, our shame? Certainly I know we try to hide it many times from each other. And you know, it says to confess to one another. And we're supposed to do that with the people that are close to us, that trust, that we trust. But we can't hide it from God. That's the conviction that he gives us to share it with others. See, like Israel, do we not care? God sees right through us and all of our false pretenses. Okay? We can't hide from God. Even when we try, even if we don't care, God still sees it. Even when we don't acknowledge him, he still sees it. God is all-knowing, God is all-seeing. You know, the best part for all of us he still loves us. Every one of us. He still loves Israel. He still loves his people. It reminded me when I was little. I remember a time I had done something wrong. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I remember my mother disciplined me, letting me know 
what I had done wrong, and there were some consequences for that action. And I remember her walking up the stairs, and then I did something I'm not very proud of. And I thought she hadn't noticed. And actually, she saw my reflection in the toaster sitting on the counter. She was going up the stairs, and she knew exactly what I had done. And she came to me, wasn't happy, but more than anything, I think it was her heart that was broken. And she still loved me. Psalms 103, verses 11 through 12 says this, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God still loves us. Even when we don't acknowledge him. Even when we try to hide from him. Even when we do any things we know we shouldn't. But as we learned last week in those first three chapters, there's still discipline, right? There's still consequences for what we do, what Israel is doing. Remember, sometimes love has to be tough love. And it's our actions that bring that about. Remember verse 4 we read a few minutes ago. It says, Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. A spirit of prostitution is in their heart. They do not acknowledge the Lord. And then for the next 10 verses, verses 5 through 14, Hosea really talks about the consequences, the tough love that's going to happen. He says that God will withdraw from them because of their unfaithfulness. Their fields and their crops will be devoured. There will be wars with the nations they aligned with. So those they thought were helping them are turning on them. It says, ultimately, like a great lion, God will tear them to pieces. Wow. There's some severe... This is hard stuff. There's some severe consequences for not understanding. See, it's our sin. It's Israel's sin that's separated from God. It can't be hidden from Him says it's just like prostitution. We're prostituting ourselves to these other things in our lives. It says it corrupts and destroys the relationship. More importantly, it causes God to withdraw from us. It causes him to withdraw from us. I know for me, there's times when I'm not in his word, I'm not thinking about him, basically not acknowledging him. And it doesn't take very long where I, like, something's out of kilter. Anybody else experience that? Something doesn't feel quite right. Or I'm doing something I just know I shouldn't be doing. That's God withdrawing from me. It's him pulling back saying, okay. I don't like that feeling, to be honest with you. Then in verse 15, it says this, I will return to my lair until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. It's only after their destruction will it cause them to finally accept responsibility and realize their only hope is to seek God. See, that's our only hope, folks. At our lowest point, in our misery, in our unfaithfulness, when we realize that, that it's our sin that brought us to this point, Israel, it's your sin that brought you here. Then it says, we too will seek him earnestly. Again, I've shared my personal story a number of times here. And it was at my lowest point in life 
my lowest point in my relationship with my wife, the lowest point I'd ever come to, that I had to seek God. <laughs> he had to catch hold of me. And I had to realize it was him and understand that it was my lifestyle, what I was doing, that had brought me to that point. I say, okay, God, I need you. And earnestly seek him. And you say, okay, well, bud, what, what do you mean earnestly seek him? How do we do that? What do I need to do? Those are great questions. We should all be asking them. And we really find the answers in this last chapter, Hosea 6, verses 1 through 3, where it says this. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. So Israel's saying here, okay, this is Israel responding to all of this. They're saying, okay, let's, let's go back to God. Let's return to the Lord. We've gone through these terrible things. Let's repent and get right with God. Let's seek him. Sounds easy. And that, in this passage, that's actually Hosea's intercessory prayer, his hope for all of us, for all of Israel is that they will repent. They'll accept responsibility for their actions. But as I was studying through this, I posed a question. Let me ask us this question. Did they really repent? Because it said there, He has torn us to pieces. He has injured us. God has done all of this. See, to me, it seems like their attitude is, since God did this, He's going to have to fix it. Since God did this to us, it's his fault. See, they're blaming God rather than taking responsibility for their own unfaithfulness. He did this to us. He tore us apart. He caused this. So they're pointing a finger at God instead of at themselves. So were they just saying these words to get out of trouble? Let me pose another hard question. Do we do that? Do we just say the words? Do we just give it lip service so we can get out of trouble? Well, Hosea 6, verses 4 through 6, tell us what God truly believes, what he saw in their words. And it says, What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. So God called them out. He's called them on their bluff. He said, your faithfulness, it's like the morning mist. It's like the dew that disappears, it vanishes. He said it doesn't last. You're just speaking words. You're inconsistent. And God's tired of their inconsistency. He's frustrated. Does our consistency last? Our devotions, are they fleeting? Are we positive one day and negative the next? Are we blaming God? Are we the same people during the week as we try to be on Sunday? It's tough stuff, folks. Hosea is tough. 
It's tough love. Okay, bud. It's tough stuff. What does God want from me? What does he really want from me then? Back in verse 6, it said this, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. See, it comes full circle. God wants us to acknowledge him, but in a personal way. He doesn't want our, he doesn't want our fake religion. He doesn't want our sacrifices. Honestly, he could care less. He says, you can have that. What he truly wants is a relationship with you, with us, with each one of us. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, actually, I, I understand why God has made me read it every day pretty much for the last two years. And that's Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is David's, David's lament, his repentance to God after being called out by the Nathan, uh, prophet Nathan for his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. And David goes before God and says, I'm sorry. Psalm 51, verses 16 through 17 says this, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. See, God doesn't want our sacrifices. He doesn't want our offerings. He doesn't want our fake religion on Sunday. He wants our hearts. It's always about our hearts. Again, it reminds me of Psalm 37, verse 4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What are your desires? Where's your heart? If it didn't think it'd come to church today, huh? Get called out by God, but he wants that for every one of us, and it's because he wants what's best for each and every one of us. He doesn't want us to live in that space of inconsistency, of unfaithfulness. See, the transformation God wants for us in our lives is really a conscious choice to live in his presence for the purpose of glorifying his name and reflecting his character in our lives. That's God's true desire. He wants your heart. So I don't know where you are in your relationship with God, I don't know where you're at. You and God know. And the tough love he has for us through Hosea is because he wants to redeem you. He wants to redeem that relationship. He has a desire for your heart, for my heart. So I just encourage you, actually I'll challenge you no matter where you are today, it's never too late. It's never too late to make it a priority to get to know God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. I thank you for Hosea as we study through this and we see your desire for us. Lord, we get it. It's hard sometimes. It's difficult. To hear these words are challenging. But your word is true, and it says it divides. <laughs> Bone and marrow divides us, cuts us to our heart. So, Father, I just ask that wherever we are in our relationship with you today, I pray that your Holy Spirit has pulled at our hearts. that each and every one of us have heard what you want us to hear. But not just to hear it, to know it, to understand it, and to live into it, to lean into it. And 
get to know you in a more personal and intimate way. In Jesus' name, amen.